So there's yet another video there saying that Darwinian evolution doesn't stand up to scrutiny. I'm going to give some of the most fundamental reasons why evolution just doesn't stand up to pure rational inquiry. Oh goody, pure rational inquiry. I get the feeling this is going to be the same kind of rational justification of things that flat earthers use. Rational arguments like, if the world's a sphere, why don't people on the bottom fall off? Or, if we're spinning around, why don't we feel it? Let's see what he has to say. To understand how evolution has not only been forcefully hailed as the only explanation for the formation of life, elevated to religious status, we should start by looking at what people believed before the theory of evolution came along. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Biological evolution simply deals with the change in organisms over time. It has nothing to do with the formation of life. It would be like claiming that fluid dynamics has to account for the formation of water. Can anybody think of an example of understanding how water works without knowing how it was formed? The aqueduct? Exactly. The Romans knew how water flowed without first knowing that it was in fact made up of two separate gases. In the same way, we can study and understand how organisms will adapt and change without needing to know where and how life began. And I don't know how often I have to repeat this. Evolution is not a religion. The theory of evolution has been studied, modified, and accepted by observation and experimentation. It was not given by revelation. If it's proven incorrect or supplanted by a better theory, then the scientific community will move on. It hasn't been. All evidence shows that small changes, or mutations, are kept or weeded out through natural selection and have resulted in the biodiversity that we can observe. Classical thinkers believed that we inherited traits from our parents, which is well established today. Yes, we know that organisms will acquire traits from their parents ever since we started... Agriculture. It doesn't take much of a scientific background to notice. Wow, breed the larger cows together and you'll get larger calves. Or, plant the seeds from the most bountiful wheat from your crop. The stalks from those seeds will produce bigger kernels. What Darwin did was identify the driving force of those changes in nature. Classical natural philosophers like Aristotle supported the cosmological argument where God created and designed life. From here, life was subject to pre-established parameters called natural law, which govern the nature of reality. By the 19th century, there was a heavy hostility towards natural philosophy, as nihilism grew in popularity. This became the foundation for all the relativism we now see today. Okay, a lot to unpack here. Natural philosophy is basically the precursor to natural science. The scientific revolution started in the 1500s, where evidence was used to determine explanations for natural events. This did explode, metaphorically speaking, in the 19th century with the concept of empirical science and specialized fields like physics and biology, but is most notably for trying to eliminate explanations we have no evidence for, such as deities, and instead using observations and experiment to determine the best explanations. It also exploded literally speaking, with the invention of dynamite in 1867. But without Darwinism as a substitute for the cosmological argument, it's doubtful that Christianity would have declined. You could argue that some other theory may have taken its place, as there was certainly a push to use science to destroy belief in God, so new ideologies could then take root. Getting into semantics here, and while everybody knows I'm always up for some antics, science doesn't destroy God. Science takes no stand in the existence of God, simply that since there is so far no evidence for one, there is no reason to accept the claims that one exists, or to use one as an explanation for natural phenomena. You can't prove something doesn't exist because of a lack of evidence. I can't prove there isn't the classical invisible pink unicorn in my garage, but I wouldn't just believe in the claims of one without evidence. There was, however, another theory around not too long before Darwinism emerged, called Lamarckism, and this was established by Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in the early 19th century. What's fascinating about this theory is that 
Although still rubbished by proponents of evolution, it's actually being proven more accurate than Darwinism as we learn about genetics. We're getting into Lamarckian evolution? Ugh. Okay, where do we start? So, the basic idea of Lamarckian evolution is that if a creature changes over its lifetime, those changes will be passed on to its descendants. These are known as acquired characteristics. The most basic idea would be that as giraffes stretch their long neck to reach leaves on tall trees, their offspring will be born with larger necks. The problem is, this isn't what observation tells us. I've talked about August Weissman in an earlier video. His work showed that changes to an organism after development do not get passed to their offspring. He determined that it was mutations in the germ cells, i.e. the sperm and egg, that were passed on to the offspring, not changes in the physical characteristics of the parent organisms after its birth. These mutations would either be passed on or not through natural selection, causing biodiversity. I'll throw a link to that video in the description below, where I get more in-depth regarding Weissman's work and how ideology can affect scientific progress. It's important to bear in mind that DNA hadn't been discovered when Charles Darwin was establishing his theory of evolution. So it should come as no surprise that our growing understanding of DNA is leading to problems for the credibility of evolution. No, DNA is actually very helpful in supporting evolution. Because of our knowledge of DNA, we now have a mechanism for mutation and where genetic changes can take place. We can even use DNA to determine how far separated two organisms are on the tree of life. And by looking at how similar their DNA is, we can estimate when two species split, in biological terms. Lamarckism essentially argues that creatures gain or lose characteristics based on environment. At first glance, this might appear the same as Darwinism, but there are key distinctions that make all the difference. It does not require millions of years of natural selection, where life evolves in tiny incremental steps. Instead, a process of more rapid change called transmutation occurs, also known as transformism. Unlike Darwinism, there are many ways we can physically observe this, even within a few generations. For example, Icelandic horses are merely small horses that adapted to living in an environment where resources are scarce. They therefore became smaller, thus reducing the amount of food required to survive. Okay, that makes absolutely zero sense in regards to Lamarckian evolution. While horses that are underfed will tend to be smaller, if that horse's offspring gets well fed, it will probably go larger than its parents. In other words, the parent's small size is not passed on. However, if you only allow horses that are born smaller to breed, for example, they're cheaper to maintain, you will end up with a smaller species. But it is interesting that you brought up Icelandic horses. They are a very fascinating example of Darwinian evolution in action. In the past, after the horses were brought to Norway, they developed a DMTR3 gene mutation. This allowed the horses to move their legs in new patterns, giving them a fifth type of gait when most horses only have three or four, called a tolt. This mutation was extremely advantageous because it allowed the horse to run faster without breaking into a gallop, and the humans that controlled the breeding liked the tolt. So, horses with this mutation were more likely to breed, passing on that mutation quickly through the population. And yes, this is technically not natural selection. Humans control the environment. But, the principle is the same. The organism with an advantage has a better chance to breed and pass on that advantage. Funnily enough, this also explains why Charles Darwin found so many unique animals on the Galapagos Islands. But Lamarckian evolution doesn't explain the unique organisms found on the voyage of the Beagle. Let's look at an example, Darwin's finches. What Darwin found was that finches on different parts of the island had different beak shapes that would be useful in those particular habitats. If we were to look at those differences through Lamarckian evolution, what would cause their beaks to change as they were alive to be, for example, longer to better dig out deep hiding insects? A better explanation, and the one that Darwin used, was the ones that had a mutation that resulted in slightly longer beaks would do better, having a better chance to thrive, and be more likely to pass on that mutation. Even humans change in this fashion, since we know that diet directly correlates with things like brain size, physical strength, and height. 
There's a myriad of other examples that demonstrate how this works. No, again, that doesn't work. If a guy is very fat and has a child, then loses the weight, then has another kid, it doesn't follow that the older child will be fat and the younger will be thin. Both children will inherit the genetic code from their father with slight, almost unnoticeable variations due to mutations, but their father's weight at certain times will not affect their genetics. Crocodiles have changed very little over time, other than the fact that they were once much larger. Equally, sharks have changed very little too, but we do know that sharks were also much larger in the past. Take the Megalodon. Isn't this really nothing more than a giant great white shark? The reason why these historical organisms are so similar to their modern day descendants is that there has been no major pressure to change their basic body shape. Evolution will drive creatures through small changes to be as efficient as possible in the environment they find themselves in. The shark-like shape that sharks have is a very efficient one for a predator in an aquatic environment. This is why, while sharks have mostly remained static in their shape for hundreds of millions of years, dolphin ancestors, which returned to the water more recently, in evolutionary standards, quickly emulated the shark's basic body shape to become more efficient predators in the same environment. Another reason Lamarckism is more accurate than Darwinism is because not only do we know that genes are inherited from parent to offspring, but the new field of epigenetics is proving that gene expression can vary far more significantly and rapidly than initially believed. What we're basically dealing with are many dormant genes that can turn on or off depending on environment. All right. This one may take a while, so grab a drink. Epigenetics is like quantum, the latest buzzword for people who misrepresent a legitimate science to give the impression that we're on the cusp of a major mystical change in humanity, like thinking our way out of cancer. And also like quantum theory, it is vastly misunderstood by those pushing such woo. Basically, what epigenetics is, is the study of how outside stimuli can affect certain genes turning them on and off. Each of our cells contain all of our genes, but they obviously don't need to use them all the time. There's no reason to construct bone where soft organs are needed and vice versa, even if the cells have the ability to do so. Sometimes outside stimuli will cause these genes to go on or off, resulting in slight changes. What is important to remember is that this does not alter DNA sequences. The DNA that is passed on contains the instructions for all these genes. A gene being switched on or off in unexpected ways does not, in itself, create any new genetic information. And while some changes in the activation of genes can be passed on, these changes aren't permanent in a genetic line. For example, responses to outside stimuli like fear or stress have been passed on to mice children or even grandchildren, but this only lasts at best a few generations and is probably due to cortisol, the stress hormone, flooding the womb during gestation. While this has been used to push yet more pseudoscience like gay genes, it does align with what we know about the expression of life. It also indicates that, rather than mutation over time, living organisms already have all the genetic information to express life in an infinite number of ways. Once you arrive at this conclusion, you realize that genetic information being pre-established makes it impossible for life to come about by pure chance. And if that's what it was, then you might have an argument. But that's not what epigenetics states. It does not say that there is all genetic information to express life in an infinite number of ways in our individual DNA just simply that some genes will be used at certain times, and outside stimuli can cause them to switch on or off. The point is that while certain genes can be made to fire because of outside stimuli, it will not result in new information. Eating certain foods or experiencing certain environmental pressure may cause inactive genes to activate, but it isn't going to change DNA directly. A change in diet will not convert my arm hair into feathers if that wasn't encoded into my DNA in the first place. Darwinism also cannot take into account how one mistake, however minor, could completely collapse an entire evolutionary chain, and this makes it all the more obvious why evolution simply cannot explain the emergence of features like the eye, wings, the process of land mammals returning to the ocean as whales, 
or countless other examples. The genetic information must be contained within life from inception to resolve this problem. All of your examples, the eye, the wing, and moving from one biome to another, can totally be explained by the slow, guess and check method of natural selection. A small number of copying mistakes will not result in a completely new organism, simply one that may have a slight benefit to survival and mating over its contemporaries. As these small changes add up over multiple generations, you will get descendants that would no longer be able to breed with their ancestors, signaling speciation. And if this happened incrementally over many millions of years, it would be absurd to think that a feature like an eye would successfully form. Life is far too sophisticated to be the result of so many incidents of chance, since the odds would be statistically impossible. Instead, something like an eye would have to be perfect from the very beginning. Otherwise, it wouldn't function. That's not true at all. All that would be needed to get a fully functioning eye is a very slight mutation that is advantageous. A simple light sensitive patch would be very beneficial to an organism or its contemporaries that did not have one, even if it just showed where light was coming from. Over time and many, many generations, this very basic light sensitive patch would become more specialized to detect things like shapes and colors. Each would be built off the previous generation. For organisms that now use sight, Mutations that gave better vision would be passed on because it would help the organism thrive, while mutations that obscured vision would be weeded out because it would not help and would be a hindrance to their ability to survive and breed. I was involved in a uh, minor debate with a, uh, a biologist about evolution, and he was really confused. He didn't understand the significance of his inability to answer my questions. You know, I had a very, very simple question for him. I said, look, if you can answer this question, then I m might well be convinced that evolutionary theory works. He said, okay, what's your question? I said, what is the average rate of evolutionary mutation? What's, what, um, what is the average rate of evolution, to put it most simply? And he couldn't understand the question. He's like, well, that, that question doesn't make any sense. I said, absolutely, it makes sense. No, the biologist was right. It happens. That question really doesn't make any sense. Random mutations are just that, random. They can't be determined to happen in an expected manner, and the environment they're in will also affect how quickly mutations that occur will be passed on. To go back to the sharks and dolphin example from earlier, Sharks have not had to drastically evolve much over several hundred million years, while dolphins had to evolve their basic shape fairly quickly. Things like population density can also affect how quickly a mutation will be transferred through a group. You can't give an average rate of mutation because so many factors will affect how quickly mutations will accumulate and be passed on. And that made me start looking deeper into it. And what I realized is that biologists do not understand the first thing about statistics. They do not understand anything about probability. They don't even have the educational background to begin to understand these issues. I actually went and checked. I checked a number of the Ivy League schools. I checked Stanford. I checked a number of other programs. You can go all the way through if you, if you get your PhD in biology, you will get, go all the way through and you might take calculus. Really? Hey, sweetie, to become an advanced cellular biologist, did you have to take any math courses? Uh, yeah, I was forced to take classes in calculus, statistics, and population genetics, which is statistics for masochists. Thanks, baby. That last one, population genetics is probably the most relevant to biologists, and while the content is basically statistics, if you got your information from checking a school syllabus, it most likely be listed under biology and not math. There are a great many other problems with Darwinism, one being that evolutionary mutations lead to unusual appearance, like a lump or any number of out-of-place features. If sexual selection is the driving force for evolution, then ask yourself why a living creature would reproduce with another creature that looks deformed or strange. 
Imagine a peacock with a mutated open wing shape pattern. That creature wouldn't be attractive to females, therefore being unable to pass its genes onto the next generation. Beneficial mutations are not huge deformities, but usually small changes that will add a slight advantage to allow an organism a better fit into their environment, or be more noticeable to potential mates. Animals, besides humans, are not really as picky as us. They don't go for what is considered beautiful, but what is more noticeable. While we may ascribe beauty in a bird's plumage, from the bird's point of view, they just notice their prospective mates more. That's why mutations that make things more attractive to prospective mates, specifically being more noticeable, get passed on. Using your peacock example, Miriam Petrie showed that peacocks with a more impressive plumage are more likely to attract the attention of the peahens. In her observations, the peacocks with the most eye spots on their train would be more likely to mate. Mutations that caused a more impressive display would mean they were more likely to attract mates. This can be a double-edged sword. This is not a good thing. <laughs> you get twice as much sword. Who would want a single-edged sword? <laughs> the more impressive the display, the more likely the male would mate, but also more likely that we would be noticed by predators and get eaten before getting a chance to breed. So in nature, a balance is usually achieved in species that have to show off to attract mates. Be noticeable enough to get laid, but not so impressive that you're more likely to get eaten. Possibly, but we're too classy to do that here. This is why organisms left to breed naturally with no predators will quickly evolve incredibly impressive displays. All they need to do is attract prospective mates and not worry about being devoured. It's time we asked ourselves why people claiming to be rational would be so emotionally invested in Darwinism. The answer is rebellion against God and Christianity. No, my acceptance of evolution as a valid theory is due to the fact that it has been consistently supported by evidence and experiment. I'm not rebelling against God. I'd have to believe in one in order to rebel against it. Your claim is about as honest as saying I don't believe in the Force because I'm simply rebelling against Darth Vader. A very efficient form of predator in aquatic environment is the static shark shaped shark ship. Is the static shark shaped shark shell. Is the static share shaped shark sh Is the static shape shark. Is the static shark shaped shut. You know what? I'm gonna fix that right now. <laughs>